Coming up on Doctype, I'll show you how to make better 404 pages. Then, Jim will show you how to clean up your JavaScript with underscore.js. So break out the birthday cake because it's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by GoDaddy. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that thinks JavaScript is a decaf latte. Or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding, Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the interwebs. Oh, yes. So believe it or not, Doctype has actually been around for an entire year now. Happy birthday to us. <laughs> pretty awesome. So for everyone that's ever watched Doctype or retweeted us or liked us on Facebook, Thank you guys so, so much for supporting our show. We really appreciate it. In other news, last week, GrooveShark updated their application, and it's now using HTML and JavaScript instead of Flash. Now, if you've never used GrooveShark before, it's a cool application that allows you to search for and listen to music in your browser. Now, up until now, it's been a complete Flash application, but in this latest revision, now HTML and JavaScript are handling all the user interface elements. Now, it still is using Flash to play the actual music, and I'm sure there's a lot of good reasons for that. But I think I've been playing with it for a few days now, and the, the interface is a lot faster and more responsive. I really like it. I think it's a step in the right direction. So great job, GrooveShark team. Really cool stuff, guys. So speaking of redesigns, our friend Chris at CSS Tricks has redesigned CSSTricks.com, or CSS-Tricks.com. And uh, it's really, really cool. If you hover around on some of the, the nav elements and on some of the ads and some of the, like, you know, other stuff in the blog posts. There's lots and lots of CSS3 transitions and transforms. So it's really cool stuff. Definitely be sure to check that out. So you will need to use, what, a more modern browser like Chrome or the latest Firefox enabled yeah, it? Yeah, I, I, I haven't tried it out in Firefox, but I have tried it out in Chrome, and I know it definitely works really well there. That's awesome. Yep. So this week, I will be telling you guys all about 404 pages. And I'll be showing you how to use underscore.js to clean up your JavaScript code. Let's check it out. 404 pages, or error pages in general, are often overlooked because it's so easy to get wrapped up in just building your website or your web app. Instead, error pages should be really helpful so that when people do get lost, it's not quite as bad. First, when your error page comes up, Try to take the blame for it. Oftentimes, a user will blame themselves when something goes wrong with computer software, but you don't have to make them feel that way. Mozilla does a great job by using copy that says, hmm, we're having trouble finding that one. Instead, shifting the blame over to them. This is also apologetic, which is another thing that all good error pages should have. Wufu also does a good job of this, again, by using copy. As a user of the website, you feel like it's Wufu that couldn't find the page and not you that couldn't find it. When your 404 page comes up, it's also a good idea to have a next step that people can take. This is the 404 page for apple.com, and in the copy at the top, they first encourage people to use the search box. Then below that, they have a full site map that will help people easily navigate to whatever it was they were looking for in the first place. This is the 404 page for Carsonified. If your site isn't very large and complex like Apple's website, and you just have a few pages like the Carsonified site, then it's a good idea to go with something that's simpler. In addition to the navigation at the top, there's also some common links listed on the right side of the page, the Think Vitamin blog, events, and the home page. Now, another thing that you'll notice about this 404 page and about Apple's 404 page is that they maintain the branding, the logo, and the navigation of the site. Let's look at another example. This is one of the 404 pages for Reddit. Here, they're utilizing the Reddit alien, which is their site logo or mascot, and at the top of the page, they're holding on to the navigation so that you can still get around if you decide you'd just rather go to another page instead. Now that I've shown you what to do, let me show you what not to do, and that's having no real 404 page at all. This is the 404 page for doctype.tv. We use Ruby on Rails for our backend, and we never really took the time to change the default error pages to something nicer. We'll probably get around to it eventually, but if you keep a list of stuff you like to do before you launch a site, make sure that adding nice 404 pages is in there. 
If the 404 page on your website is bad or non-existent, don't feel too bad because even Google doesn't have a helpful 404 page. Now, out of all the pages we looked at, there is one advantage to these terrible 404 pages. They don't consume much bandwidth at all, and if you're running a huge website like Google is, then you probably want to keep the bandwidth of your 404 pages to a minimum. So, to sum things up, your 404 pages should be apologetic, they should look like your website, and they should give the users a next step. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you gonna go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctite.tv from? So we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you gonna use? Enter the code DOCTYPE3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com many programming languages provide a rich standard library of helpful methods sadly javascript has a very minimal set of built-in methods fortunately there are libraries that exist that add this sort of functionality into javascript and we're going to be looking at one today called underscore underscore is a library that provides a lot of functional programming support but it does it without actually extending or modifying any of the built-in object, but instead it holds all of its methods in a variable named the underscore. Now it provides a lot of functions for dealing with arrays, objects, and functions, and if you used other languages, many of these concepts may be familiar to you, especially if you've used a programming language that uses functional programming techniques. Now there are way too many methods for us to cover all at once, but we're gonna take a look at a few of them right now. Now this is a method called each. Now you can see that the each is a property of the underscore object here. So the each takes two arguments. The first argument is a list and the second argument is a function. And what each does is it takes every element in your list and calls the function and passes in that element into the function. So for instance, in each of one, two, and three, we're going to alert the num. So if we were to execute this code, we're gonna see three alert boxes one saying one, the next one two, and three. Now you can see we simply call it by calling underscore dot each, which is the name of our method, passing the list and passing a function, and then it'll execute just like that. Now this sort of functionality is just a basic loop. It's another way to write a loop something like this, where we have a normal for loop and we iterate over the length and we get the variable out using the array notation. But what underscore does is allows us to make our code a lot cleaner. And this type of functionality exists in a lot of other programming languages. What's neat about the each method is it can also work on JavaScript objects. So here we have a thing with the key color being red and the size being medium. And we can just pass that object in and our function will now take two properties, value and key. So now we can construct an alert that uses the key, which would be color or size. And we'll make a string that says key is value and we'll get something like this, color is red or size is medium. The next method we're gonna look at is the map method. Now this is a very common method in many programming languages. And what the map method does is it takes in one list and a function and that function will return an object and all of those objects will be returned. So it's a way to transform one list into another. So in this example, we're starting off with an array of objects and each object has a first and a last property in it. Then we call underscore dot map and pass in that object. Now, every time our function that we pass in is called, it's going to be passed one of the objects in our array. So the first time around, it's gonna be passed this first object, being Jim Hoskins, and the next time it'll be Nick Pettit. So what we do is inside of this function is we return something that we ultimately want to have a list of. In my case, I want to create strings of our full names. So I'll just return p dot first, which is Jim, plus a space, and then plus p dot last. So the map function will take all those return values, make an array out of them, and return it. So the end result is a array with Jim Hoskins and Nick Pettit as strings in it. So in the map function, you'll always get the same amount of elements in your return array that you had in your original array. So our first one will correspond to our first input, and our second output will correspond to our second input. Now there are a lot of other cool methods. One of them is called select, and this will take in a list of numbers and a function that will be a test function on them. So if the test function returns true, 
it will include that particular value from the input array in the output. In this case, we're selecting all the even numbers by having our test function take the mod of two, testing equal to zero, meaning it's even. So if we bring in one, two, three, four, five, six, and run it, the result will be two, four, and six. Another cool method is the flatten method, which takes an array, and if you have nested arrays, for instance, this array has a single element one, but the next element is an array containing two, and the next one is three and four, what the flatten method does is it will take all of those nested arrays and flatten them down so it's just a single one, two, three, four array. The intersect method takes any number of arrays and will return an array that contains only the elements that existed in all of those input arrays. So if we call intersect with these three different arrays, it'll return us an array with values one and two, since those are the only values that appeared in all three of our inputs. Now there are a lot of methods in underscore.js and we only had time to cover these few. In fact, there are over 78. But if you're programming in JavaScript, a tool like underscore can dramatically clean up your code and make JavaScript even more enjoyable to program in. That is it for this week. Until next time, be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype TV on Twitter. And if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of Doctype, send us an email at questions at doctype.tv. And if you subscribe via RSS or iTunes or YouTube, you'll never miss an episode of Doctype. So why not? So until next Tuesday, remember that every great web page starts with Doctype.